So again, who we have today is Leslie Appleton Young. She's the chief economist for CAR. Heard her many times. In fact, we were just on a call together last hour. And it's just amazing the information that she has and can share with us all. So I'm going to turn it over to Leslie because we've kind of got a, a time deadline today and want to make sure that we can get everything done that we need to get done for you. So Leslie, it's all yours. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. And hello, everybody at North San Diego. It's great to see you. I'm sorry I'm not seeing you in person. I know I've got a lot of um, friends online, but we're just uh, making do with what we've got here. So hold on and let me, okay, I need to get screen sharing from the host. So um, if somebody can let me share my screen, I'd be happy to get into my uh, presentation. You should have ah, Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Um, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. There we are. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm going to start with just a, a kind of a wish and a prayer. <laughs> and, you know, we've been doing monthly. Um, monthly survey work for a long time, but during uh, the last four plus months, we've actually been doing a weekly survey of our members, asking them all kinds of, of questions. And we do get a lot of um, very spirited responses from this uh, survey. But for a couple of weeks, we asked um, when we were kind of in the, in the midst of the severe lockdown, um, what your concerns were as a member of CAR that we'd lift things too easily, uh, if we'd um, take too long, um, or if unsure. And I just wanted to show you that there is a 100% lack of consensus within our, um, on our industry on that, um, that question. And I just note this as a way of saying, um, we don't have agreement. There's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of difficult conversations going on all over the place. And I think the way forward with all of this is to stay focused on your clients, you know, on the buyers and the sellers. We know that there is a tremendous amount of pent-up demand for housing in California, even in normal times. <laughs> but I think what you've seen over the last six weeks or so has been just a, um, a flood of people that have been uh, waiting for the 2020 home buying season uh, season to start. And there are sellers with a lot of concerns and a lot of questions and they need, they need you, they need us as an industry. So let's really try to stay focused on our business purpose. And I think that will uh, bode well for us as we go, um, as we go through this. Um, you know, the way I'm thinking of it uh, with respect to the economy overall is that a pause button was pushed uh, in the middle of March and everything stopped. We had a, um, an economy that was um, by many measures very healthy. Uh, you may recall that in February the unemployment rate was 3.5 percent which was you know the lowest that we have ever um, ever recorded. The housing market in particular, and certainly in California, was off to a great start. We were seeing price appreciation of 8% above a year ago levels. We were seeing very healthy increases um, in, um, uh, in sales. And I was just absolutely thrilled to, to see that we were going to have a great uh, a great 2020. And then the pandemic hit and everything um, everything stops. So to say that this has been an unanticipated year full of unexpected um, uh, events is to really put it mildly. So, you know, one, one step at a time here with, with all of us. Um, the data that we're going to be seeing over the next week or so is, like all data, backward looking. Um, just to give you a warning, the GDP number for the second quarter will be coming out on Tuesday. It is likely to be a very ugly number with a drop month to month, um, I'm sorry, a drop quarter to quarter of about 35%, 30 to 40%, something in that range. We have only so far seen a, um, a 5% drop in the, in the first quarter. And when you look at the first quarter, we were really doing great guns until the middle of, 
um, middle of March. So this is just a precursor, if you will, to a very dramatic, um, dramatic drop. And as you can see from this chart, when we look at the major um, financial, academic, and governmental entities that do forecasting, there is no, um, there's no agreement on what the, all the specific numbers are, but there is, and at least has been, this was updated um, at the end of last month, an agreement that the second quarter would really be the worst. It would reflect the complete lockdown of the economy in many, in many states, and that to one degree or another, we'd be improving in the third quarter and the fourth quarter. With the drop in GDP for the year as a whole, ranging from a low of, um, of a, a drop of 5% to a high of 11 or, or 12%. Um, but I think, unfortunately, I need to note that these forecasts are kind of predicated on an assumption that there wouldn't be um, a second wave, that the loosening of restrictions would continue uh, uninterrupted. And what we know today is that is not the case, and you're certainly seeing that um, in our state of California. Um, locking down the economy the way that it was in March and April, April reduced um, daily GDP, daily economic activity in California by almost a third, by 2.8 billion. And the revenue implications of this are very, very severe. The budget that the governor um, uh, released, if you will, presented to um, in, in Sacramento had a deficit of 58 billion. The California Rainy Day Fund, which until a few months ago looked ample, uh, is only 17 billion. So there are going to be very difficult choices uh, in severe repercussions for, uh, for government and the services provided by government um, in, the, in the weeks, months, and years ahead because of this um, this experience. I mean, you you know, we know that the the, um, the federal government can do helicopter money, right? They can print it and they can drop it. Uh, state governments can't do that. Local governments can't do that. So that's where you really feel the um, the overall uh, squeeze. Um, again, looking backwards, we had an economy that was coming back to life in May and June. Retail sales were up quite sharply in May, 18.2%. They were up again in June by 7.5%. Um, so we had, you know, um, a, lot of, um, a lot of reason to be optimistic about how things were um, were going. We even had an improvement as we went into June into um, the number of people that were actually going into restaurants. So even by mid-July, it was off 70%. It was still up from being completely closed down um, at the um, at the end of May. And as you know, those in many areas, those that now is not possible, right? Restaurants are are closed, open only for uh, for curbside. Some have outdoor dining. It really depends on the um, area, but things have slowed down. Um, and uh, also looking in the rearview mirror in June, the unemployment rate nationally was quote unquote only 11.1%. Uh, so it was coming down um, in a way that that was really very um, very encouraging. And I'm not saying don't be encouraged now. I'm just saying there's a lot more uncertainty <laughs> about the future um, with the, the, the cases being what they, uh, what they are and the policy decisions that are made um, in response, uh, response to that. Um, here's a look at the um, increase in uh, in non-farm um, employment in May and June. So again, that was very uh, encouraging. Um, while employment was still down um, by 15 million from pre-COVID, it was moving in the absolute right direction. But now we've hit a little bit of a snag and the data that came out yesterday for the week ending July 18th actually showed the first increase since mid-March in the initial unemployment claims. So that is a big red 
red flag. Continuing claims were still coming down, but the initial claims um, had, you know, came down very significantly, very sharply in April and May, leveled off, but were still lower until the data that was released um, yesterday. So what that means is that in a four month period, 53 million Americans have applied for help because they lost their jobs. During the Great Recession, it took two years for 37 million people to apply. And as you know, it's, I never thought I would look back on the Great Recession and think, gee, that wasn't so bad. But when you look back on it and think, you know, things were tough and the real estate industry was hit so hard. Um, what did we also know? We know we could go out to dinner, right? We knew we could get together with family and friends. And for many, uh, many people, job loss was not um, uh, not an issue, right? Certainly the service sector um, maintained that level of employment, um, the same level of employment throughout that, um, throughout that experience. Here's a look at the continuing uh, claims for unemployment in in California. So anyway, the employment picture is looking very um, a little bit more cloudy at, at this point. Um, what about the stock market? Um, you know, the stock market is not reflecting what's going on in the economy, but it really never is. It's it's not it's not the economy. It is investors' expectations of where the economy is headed. It's the bets on what sectors are going to do. Uh, well, is it tech? Is it cyclical? You know, what commodities, like what, what is it? And so we had a just a very dramatic improvement after the drop that, that bottomed at the end of, um, end of March. And the NASDAQ has been doing um, better because stocks have been doing, um, the stocks in tech have been doing uh, better. If you've been following Zoom, Netflix, and Amazon, you know that they are at least at this point, the winners, right? I mean, if we'd only known in January that we were going to be on Zoom for the re for the rest of the year, we might have made different um, different investment decisions. So there there has certainly been a re uh, a reallocation um, there. I mentioned the increase in retail sales, and I want to say with respect to um, online retail, it will be like 150 percent increase in online retail sales this year. It has changed consumer behavior and and certainly it's nothing new but it's new to a lot of people that never did it before and they were forced to do it and they like it right it's the convenience and and the speed so um people will go out but not the same so that's one of the big guessing games right now is how um how many of the changes in behavior that have been forced during this period will become permanent when we are through this. And I want to assure everybody, because sometimes I need to be reassured, um, this will end. We will get through this. There will be um, a vaccine. It's just the, uh, the timing that is, um, that is uncertain. Um, the University of Michigan um, and the conference board both do kind of competing confidence um, uh, measures for consumers. And the um, conference board their July number isn't out yet, but the Michigan number comes out sooner and it reflects what we would have expected. And that is July consumer sentiment has taken a bit of a, uh, a turn down after improving, um, uh, improving in a healthy way in, in June. So that's another, you know, you look at the unemployment numbers, you look at this, you know that things are changing. So we've got a few things to talk about with respect to the government's response to uh, to the pandemic. And I want to say up front, I think the federal government has done an, a, a really good job. It hasn't been perfect, but compared to the Great Recession, where it took a long time to get relief to the economy, this time wasting no time. And here's just kind of a list of what came out of um, Congress and signed by the president. Uh, within the first couple of months, the the um, the gem here was the CARES Act that was signed by President Trump on March 
on March 27th. And honestly, you can pick it apart and say some people got too much and some people that got stuff shouldn't have gotten anything. And there were incredible bottlenecks and all that might be true, but it really did what it was designed to do, which was keep people afloat during the initial stages of the um, pandemic. The big question today is, what do we need now, given that this isn't an eight week event, that this is going to go on, it looks like quite a bit um, longer. So um, on May 15th, the House passed a $3 trillion relief bill. There are negotiations going on right now between Republicans, the White House, and the Democrats on the second, um, uh, well, it's not gonna be the second, but I mean, it's it's the next big um, relief, um, relief package. So we will um, see how that goes. Unfortunately, there are people today that are losing their um, uh, unemployment supplement and um, there will be a gap of, of some kind and a, ch a change in, in support. So again, that will be, you know, that'll be difficult for some people, absolutely. Um, what about monetary policy? Well, again, I have to give Chairman Powell a, a gold star. He has been very clear and very forceful in his language ever since the beginning of the year on the Fed's willingness and ability to keep rates low for a long time, right? The Fed always says forward guidance. I mean, this forward guidance has been really clear. Do not expect to raise in rates until 2022. You know, essentially rates are going to uh, stay low. Their purchases of securities have expanded to include much riskier assets than they usually buy. So treasuries, mortgage-backed securities, but they're also looking at corporate debt, at municipals. They, you know, they learned to fight the last war, right? And they are not going to let a lack of liquidity um, be, a, be a problem. So here's a, a look at... at um, uh, at, at how low rates are, you know, we have, have historically uh, low rates. I think it was last week, it was below 3%, right, for a 30-year conforming 2.98%. I mean, absolutely incredible. And, and certainly has been fueling the demand, um, the demand that, that um, our industry has been feeling, uh, right? It's, it's just been an incredible um, opportunity there. Um, but in addition to low rates, we've also had somewhat tighter credit, right? We've had an increase um, by some, uh, some financial institutions in your credit score and in down payments, and particularly for jumbo loans, which are very important in California. About 20% of the loan originations in California are, are, are jumbos. And, you know, investors, there's been a flight to safety. Nobody really is interested in holding on to a mortgage that isn't insured explicitly or implicitly um, through the GSEs um, at, a, at a time like this. So in the weekly survey that we do, we asked the realtors if they've had a buyer who all of a sudden can't qualify because of changing credit conditions. And um, almost um, a quarter, 24% said, said yes. So this is definitely a, um, a factor in, in the California market. Um, all that being said, purchase applications today are above where they were um, a year ago by, uh, by about 15%. I mean, this isn't refis, this is, you know, new originations. Um, we also have, and again, this is in the CARES Act. The CARES Act said any mortgage that is either, you know, insured implicitly or explicitly by the federal government, you can request up to a year of forbearance and it's, you know, 90 days, uh, 90 days at a time. So um, we've got over 4 million properties <laughs> currently in forbearance. Now the good news is about half of those, the uh, home, the borrower is paying on the mortgage. So it was taken out more, more as a, um, like a security on the, on the future, more as an insurance, um, an insurance policy. Um, but even though the CARES Act forbearance does not allow your credit to be dinged and you can't be charged additional fees and there can't be a balloon payment um, when you start paying again, it is counted as a, a delinquent payment. 
So in the most recent uh, data we have available from CoreLogic, and that's for um, April of uh, 2020, 6.1% uh, of the mar uh, mortgages were at least 30 days um, past due. So we are fully expecting to see that number um, uh, increase in the, um, in the months ahead. Um, another concern is evictions, and that is how many people are, are, you know, not going to be able to pay their rent once the unemployment support um, goes away. And the only thing I could find right now was this data for Los Angeles County that said about 365,000 units are uh, fragile, um, uh, if you will, because the rent burdens are very high and it is the renters that have been most impacted. It's the moderate and low income working class renters that have been most likely to lose their jobs and you know, the, the, um, uh, our social distance world, um, if you will. So that is another um, concern for the housing uh, community. So how are we doing in California? Um, one of the things we do, as I mentioned, is a lot of surveys. And since um, September of 2018, we have been asking Californians, is it a good time to buy or sell in, in California? Uh, in July, 31% said it's a great time to buy. And that's actually higher than what we've gotten before, you know, our the average. Um, is it a good time to sell? We actually had the third third week, uh, third month in a row where it has increased. So you can see we had a big drop between March and April and that's coming back. So my takeaway looking at this slide is the buy side is back. The buy side is ready to go. And the sell side, which has always been an issue in California in terms of listings and boomers not moving and people staying in their homes longer, that's where the challenge is, right? It always seems to be an inventory story uh, in California. So the June data, again, looking back in the rearview mirror, these are going to be transactions that were put into escrow um, typically in, in May. Um, we saw home sales on a year-to-year -year basis down 12.8%, but the largest month-to-month -month increase of 42%. You'll see that in a minute. Um, the median home price at 626.170 is the highest statewide median we have ever recorded. Uh, inventory tightened, it dropped by about 20%, the unsold inventory index, and about 19 days on the market was the median time a property was on the market. So here was the big news. We had a 42.4% increase month to month in, um, in home sales in, um, in California uh, last month. So you had just a tremendous amount of, of pent up demand and people were ready to go. They wanted to take advantage of, of rates and really get things done, um, tried to get back on the timeline that had been, um, that had been um, interrupted. Um, what do we see going forward? Again, the, the June you know, the June data is kind of rear view mirror. Um, we are looking at data on a weekly basis. We're actually looking at it on a daily basis and calculating average daily um, data per week. So the average daily closed sales in California for the week ending June, uh, I'm sorry, July 17th, right? So that's last week. Uh, was 791, and please note that it was a bit lower than the week ending on 711. So, given pending sales, which you'll see in a minute, we are we are baked in to have good numbers for uh, for July in terms of closed sales. But you can see you've got a little bit of a pullback. We'll have to see if that becomes a um, a trend or not. Right? We had a week to week drop of 4.5. Um, percent. Um, the other thing that happened in June is the upper end of the market actually increased on a year-over-year -year basis. We had a 6.8% increase in the luxury market. In this uh, graph, it's per properties priced um, over $2 million. Um, That's about 5% of the total market. And we had the biggest drop in sales on a year-over-year -year basis 
for properties priced under 300,000. And I will tell you what that story is. That story is no supply, inventory very, very low. Um, Southern California makes up 45% of home sales um, in California. Um, San Francisco Bay Area, even with all of the um, things that are interesting and the booming economy, that's only 19% of, of total sales. So we've got a much bigger geographic area and population centers um, centers down here. And all of those areas were down um, in June on a year over year basis. What about pending sales? Well, if you recall, we had over a 60% increase in pendings in, um, in May. In June, it was 22.5%. So that's why I say good numbers for uh, July and into August are, are really baked in with these, um, we, with these pendings. We had actually the biggest year over year gain um, since April of 2012 uh, in the in the June uh, numbers. And when I look at the daily pending sales, the average daily pending sales, we had an uptick in the last two weeks, right? From June, uh, July 11th to a July uh, 17th. So closings were down on a week to week, but pendings are coming back up. So I think that again, bodes well for the data that we're going to see um, in July um, and in August, uh, pendings were up 8.6% for California. They were up 4.5% for um, Southern California. Um, we also asked in that weekly survey if people had noticed a slowdown in market activity in the last couple of weeks. And about four out of 10 of the realtors who answered the question said yes. And three quarters of them about said it was, you know, both buy side. Um, and the sales side. So that's the sales side. What's happening with prices? Well, as I mentioned, record high median home price uh, in June. Now, part of that was that year over year, six and a half percent gain at the upper end of the market, but price gains were experienced also in every price category. So this wasn't just a compositional uh, change, if you will. You can see that by looking at the uh, price per square foot uh, data that was up 0.7% year over year and up 4.3 month to month. So that kind of takes away all the change in the composition of what's selling and just looks at price per square a foot. So that's always a good check on how you're um, analyzing the uh, data. When we break the market out by quintiles, bottom 20%, da da da, top 20%, can see what I mean. The top 20% of the market had the most rapid price appreciation, 7.4% on a year over year basis. And if you break out the top 20%, that also is a, a, an increasing function, right? And the very top of the market here um, at 11.8%. Um, appreciation. So I know some of the people listening to this call are selling in some very beautiful, um, lovely and expensive areas <laughs> near the uh, near the water and uh, you should be um, have um, have experienced that. Uh, here's a look at the median closed sale price per square um, per square foot. You can see in Southern California a little bit of a um, um, an uptick. Here's a look at the percentage of closed sales with price reductions, and this is data that's a little bit more dated because I didn't have it for um, for um, for um, uh, last week. And then another really interesting thing that's happened when we ask in our survey, we ask realtors, "Are your buyers expecting prices to go down?" About half of them say yes. In the last survey, 54% said yes. So there is this expectation that the pandemic is going to cause prices to go down. But what you see on the sell side is the discounting that's going on looks very much like the discounting that was going on before the pandemic. There does not appear to be a rush to discount to sell on the part of um, home buyer, homeowners. Uh, inventory mentioned, uh, we had about a 20% drop uh, in inventory in June. Uh, 2.7 months means that the current rate property is selling. I'm going to be all done in 2.7 months. Active listings were down over 40% <laughs> in June. I mean, just, you know, that's where the 
the bottleneck is in the California market. It's in, uh, it's in supply. Uh, here's a, a way to compare this year to last year and the year before. So uh, the 2020 active listings by month um, are in orange and below last year and below uh, the year before every single month. So this just isn't pandemic related. This is California housing market um, related. Uh, in Southern California, a year ago, we had 28,744 listings. This year in June, 15,084. So that's, you know, I think that is a very sobering, um, sobering number to just see how huge that gap uh, is. And in June, um, while sales dropped 12.2% in Southern California, active listings dropped over three times that, 47.5%. Um, so we're just burning through, uh, burning through the um, inventory. What are we seeing in terms of the average daily new listings? Um, in the week ending July 17th, we had a drop from the week before. That was a decline of 8.6% statewide and about 10.2% for, um, for Southern California. And again, this is week to week data. It can be noisy. So I am not calling a trend, but I am watching whatever data point I can get that's, um, that's available to just get a sense for uh, what's, um, um, what's going on. So um, let me just kind of go through your, um, your area. Um, here's the uh, county um, numbers. The median home price at 678 for San Diego County uh, was up 2% on a year-over-year -year basis. Home sales were up 1.7% on a year-over-year -year basis. So that's not what we're seeing statewide. So that's overperforming the state. Um, as a whole, and the year-to-year -year decline, 11.3%, uh, um, with a 58% month-to-month increase between May and June. So that's really, uh, really incredible. Inventory, very tight, 2.2 months, with a median of 12 days on the market. So that's the whole um, county. And then I just went through, I, I pulled all of these um, slides from the car.org um, website. Uh, they're available to all members. You can pick a city in almost every county in California that we you know that we can do, um, and they're updated every month. So here's Encinitas, and you can see there were 27 closings last month. The median home price was 1.65, increasing 12.2 percent, and active listings were off um, about 23% with 74 active listings. Uh, Carlsbad, a little bit more affor affordable at 1.09 million, but an increase of 10.4% on a year over year basis. Home sales were up in Carlsbad by 19.4%, and active listings were down almost 40%. So amazing how you know close proximity you can get such different. Um, uh, different market dynamics. What about Fallbrook? I know there's people on the call that grew up in Fall Fallbrook. <laughs> so um, median home price of six hundred thousand down just a little on a year over year. Home sales sixty nine properties sold as uh, closed escrow down only eight percent a year over year, but a huge drop in active listings. Only ninety six active listings in in June. Um, here's a look um, a look at Del Mar, a uh, very high median price over slightly over two million, and it was actually up three point six percent year to year. Thirteen homes uh, sold, up forty four percent from last year, and a drop in listings of about twenty three percent. So, you know, one of the dynamics I'll talk about at the end of my my remarks is just how many people are taking the work from home, work from anywhere. Um, opportunity and moving to really beautiful, desirable places that they can still keep working remotely. It, it's um, uh, it's it's really interesting to see this play out really across the country. Uh, Rancho Santa Fe, uh, same 2.36 million, up almost 5% uh, year to year. Uh, home sales are actually up a little bit and inventory down, although certainly 
per size of, of 173 properties is a pretty healthy inventory. Um, Oceanside, Oceanside price 605, um, very affordable, up 5.5. Um, you know, in any other part, many other parts of the country to call 605 affordable, you people would think you were crazy. So I know you're Californians, you know what I mean. Um, 104 uh, properties um, closed escrow, that's an increase of 25% year over year, and about half the inventory, um, 98 listings on the market. San Marcos, uh, median home price of 708,000, 66 properties closed escrow and 77 active listings, so half what it was a year ago. Uh, Vista, 600,000, median home price up almost 7% year to year, 92 properties closed escrow, 75 active listings. So I hope that gives you a flavor for the marketplace that is, um, that is surrounding um, surrounding the association and that you're all uh, familiar with and you can see some commonalities depend on where um, the location right and um, uh, and and the price price category so again very different depending on where you are um, the weekly survey that we do I'm just going to share a couple of, um, of responses because I, I don't want to put um, you know too many slides but um, one of the things we're hearing is that people are going into escrow and buying houses sight unseen. So we asked, um, have you had a buyer put a contract in where the client hadn't seen the home? And 15% um, of the respondents last week said, yes, I have. So there's a little bit of that going on. We asked if you had vacant listings, 48% of the uh, realtors who responded said yes they did oh and then we asked if they did it on purpose <laughs> you know like get out of the house so it's easier for us for me to show it and uh, 48 percent of uh, 44 percent said um said yes um did you have showing activities this week about half of the realtors 45 percent said yes um they did we asked if it took longer to close escrow about four out of ten said yes, and they, um, you know, it's it's basically the on on the lending side, and I think I did those already. Okay, so why don't we close here, close out a little bit, and talk about the the forecast? What letter of the alphabet is the forecast? I'm going to go with the Nike swoosh, which was the pause, drop, dramatic, and a slow. Uh, recovery and right now I think that really does seem like the best uh, bet. Here's a look at some of the national um, data uh, for forecasts coming from NAR, uh, Fannie Mae and the Mortgage Bankers Association and I just wanted you to see the commonalities in terms of direction. I mean NAR has a, a sharper drop in the second quarter and a sharper improvement in the third quarter but other than that, they're all telling a, a similar a story, which now is coming a little bit under uh, under question or or more uncertainty. Uh, prices a much more subdued uh, change. We're expecting only a slight decline in the statewide median this year, and it's possible it may even um, go up. I mean, it's it's really been um, you know on a. <laughs> We're like tracking things so uh, so uh, closely and and revising our forecast every six weeks or or so and it honestly keeps getting a little bit more positive so we'll we'll see if we're able to um, uh, to continue there. Here are all the numbers on those. I'm not going to go through them, but if you wanted to look at what those uh, forecasts are, our forecast is for the year as a whole, a 12.7% drop in sales and a 1.1% increase um, in, in price. I will be presenting the, um, you know, the economic outlook um, at, our, uh, at our virtual expo uh, in October, and I'm, I'm hoping that it will be uh, more, um, more positive than this is. Um, but it will be to be revealed by the summer. Here's a look at sales and here's a look at prices. Um, I did want to just mention that um, we are also expecting a drop in membership this year uh, and next year. We usually have about a two year lag between, let's say a peak in home sales, as you can see here in Teal and a peak in membership. And uh, 
that relationship has kind of come unhooked a little bit over the last seven or eight years with a flat market and increasing uh, membership. But given the, the flow of new licensees coming out of the DRE, you can see for the in the April data, we had half the number of real estate salespersons licensed issued than the year before. Um, we're pretty confident looking at about a 5% drop in members this year, driven largely by, um, by the drop in, um, you know, the new licensees coming in because the people that renewed their licenses had already uh, done so. Um, our current forecast for membership next year is for a drop of a little bit over um, 8%. There is a, a, a historical relationship between the market um, and our and our membership, and given the demographics of um, of the industry, um, this should precipitate maybe some some earlier retirements than maybe would have been expected. So, um, I'm hoping to revise this upward too, but this is where we are right now. Uh, so, what's next? You know, this is the big question, right? It's like, what is the new normal um, going to look like? And we know it's changed business practices. This is just the question: Are you doing more virtual? Uh, tours. Well, virtual tours have been around for years, but now we've got, you know, over half of our um, of our uh, respondents saying, yes, I am doing more virtual tours. It's becoming part of what um, of of what I do. So a couple of things that are that are changing and one is the impact of work from home. And there's been a whole host of surveys that have been done for companies themselves and for the community, um, the country um, at large, um, about three quarters um, uh, of at least, well, half to three quarters of the people that are working from home that are able to work from home say they want to keep doing it. Um, of that group, two thirds say they would really look at moving somewhere else, you know, if they had that flexibility. Um, there's no doubt that we're seeing more interest in the exurbs, in the suburbs, uh, in resort um, communities, the deserts, um, uh, Lake Tahoe, um, you know, just it opens up a whole new world of, you know, where, where do I want to, um, where do I want to live when I'm disconnected from a commute that's going to make that um, unhappy. Um, a couple months ago, uh, there was a call on Twitter to post a picture of your home office, and I got such a kick out of them. I thought I'd pick a few of them to share because it really drives home the point that we are going to see a change in the type of housing that is in demand because of this experience. You know, you've heard about needing a home office. Well, what about needing two home offices? And what about looking at your house, not as a place to eat and sleep before I go to work, but actually where I go to work, <laughs> where I go to work out, where I go to educate my children, where I go to feed my, my family, and even an acceleration in the multi-generational um, housing is, is something that we are expected. So bigger space and different types of space are going to be um, going to be um, um, expected. So I think you are just also going to see people wanting to redo, remodel, uh, reconfigure um, the space that they um, that they have because of flexibility in in use. Um, you know, again, open floor plans. It's been part of our world for a long time, but I think you're just going to see an acceleration of. Um, of those trends, particularly in, in situations where people can't move and they're in a dense environment. So they're not as eager to be out, um, out in the um, open spaces. The other thing I wanna, I wanna suggest is that we are gonna see some real silver linings in the office space and in the retail spaces that are going to be vacated as a result of kind of the hammering of the shutdown of the economy um, coupled with changes in behavior, right? A, a need for less office space because more people are working from home, a need for less retail space because people are doing more of their transactions um, 
um, online. So that's my thought, you know, why don't we turn those properties into affordable villages or senior villages or homeless villages? You know, I feel like my whole career has been, been spent talking about affordable housing and lack of supply. So um, this is something the Strategic Planning Committee at CAR is looking at very, very um, seriously, how to foster um, incentivize these kinds of conversions to make them a real win-win for for all of our um, all of our um, communities. So here, this kind of turning malls into um, into homes is is something that we'll have to to look at. So I think when all is said and done, I think residential real estate is going to be a winner, and I think it's going to be leading the the economy. Uh, back to health. I think the tech-enabled agent clearly has a huge advantage. I think the tech-enabled agent that is also a relationship-centric agent that knows how to leverage the fact that everybody's Zooming to be Zooming, you know, to be reaching out, to be forming meaningful connections um, in, a, in a digital virtual world, and then housing supply. So those are my kind of my hopes going forward. Um, here's a couple of books that have, have really changed my life um, in, in my career. Um, we Need to Talk is about active listening. It's about not waiting to talk, but really listening to what people have to say. And I can't think of a profession that is more dependent on being a good listener than real estate. Can you, right? <laughs> Humans Are Underrated is a fabulous book. It will make you optimistic about the future, right? It's, it's what humans bring to the table that's more important than ever. And Crucial Conversations, I mean, you know, they're the, the ones that you don't want to have are the most important ones to have. And who has more crucial conversations than a realtor with their clients? like nobody. So how do you diffuse the situation <laughs> and make it a productive conversation where people are listening to each other and learning? So highly recommend those. And then finally, where to get all the data that I've presented. This is car.org. And there are four channels to go into. We are in the Industry 360 channel. It's the market data section. You will find all our data and stats our podcast, our weekly summary of what happened, all of our shareable and interactive reports like the ones I used in my presentation, every speech that's given by some, me or someone on my staff is posted both as a PDF and a PowerPoint. So you can steal our slides if you want them and all of our surveys and reports. So I hope that you'll take advantage of this very, very deep commitment the organization has to um, to data and, and trans, um, transparency. So with that, I hope I haven't exhausted everyone. I hope you're feeling um, relatively optimistic about the San Diego um, area market, which is outperforming uh, the rest of the state, albeit in, in very difficult times, right? There's just, uh, no one's ever been down this road before, right? So uh, we, we do the best that we can. Well, I have to say, Leslie, I'm, I'm a little frustrated and flabbergasted because I had about 25 questions written out as you were talking, and then two slides later, you would answer that question. So I'm trying to keep up with that and figure out what questions I can ask, but a, a ton of great information. And, and um, there's a couple of things I do want to highlight, though, and, and I know that your survey, because I have to answer those, is, and we appreciate it, Chris. Yeah. We really do. <laughs> is the supply issue. I mean, that really is the fundamental issue. Because if we had twice as many, I, I'm in Fallbrook, which had the 62% drop in inventory, and so we're living there every day. Um, if we had twice as many listings, we'd have twice as much business. So in the survey or, or with what you're dealing with, is there a common theme about why there isn't more property on the market? Is it COVID-related and people hesitant to do that? And have people in their home or what are you finding? Um, it is partly COVID related and, and I say this on top of a tight supply situation anyway, right? That is boomers not moving and people not wanting new construction near where they live. So that's been kind of a reality in California um, from the get-go. 
But the new aspect with COVID is people having uncertainty about their lives and what they want to do, coupled with not wanting people to come through their homes, coupled with not wanting to go look for a home and go into other um, other houses. So just a lot of that psychological um, psychological stuff, because I can't give you a non-pandemic reason for why inventory should be even tighter than it was a year ago. Although, as you saw in the graphs, it started that in January, right before the pandemic. It just has accelerated during the pandemic. And I think you're right. I've said many times that our business relies on people moving because they want to. There has to be a a confidence in what's happening. Right. That, that death, divorce, and job transfer isn't enough to sustain our industry. And, and if people are uncertain about anything, the economy or an election or health or whatever, they just it's easier to hold tight than it is to take some type of action. Right. And I also think work from home, work from anywhere is kind of an embarrassment of riches. Like you mean I could live anywhere in the United States. I've got research to do. I've got to talk to people. I've got to check in with my family, you know, so that may be part of it too. You're just paralyzed by so many um, options. You know? No, that's a great point. So another, I mean, I'm, get, I'm really guessing your, your questions is it's a really excellent one. And I, I don't have a, a fully great answer. I, I don't know that anybody does. And I was hoping that you, you could pull something out of your, out of the hat. Oh, really? <laughs> I do want to ask another question on kind of a macro level. Um, obviously, what the government, the federal government had to do to keep us afloat was important. But you add three or four or five trillion dollars on top of our deficit, deficit, and what does this do to us in the long run? I mean, are we ever going to be able to get out of this as a country? Well, you know, there's a lot of different opinions about this. I mean, clearly that money's got to go somewhere. And we talked about this after the Great Recession. And I can tell you what happened to all the money. It was over 800 billion, right? That was thrown at the banks and, you know, into the foreclosure situation and so on. And essentially it's really just been kept as excess reserves by the banking system. So the potential for the hyperinflation that everyone's expecting is there, but in the last 12 years, it hasn't, been an issue. In fact, the economy um, has given us what an uh, inflation rate that's been below um, below two percent. So I understand the thinking, and you're absolutely right. It it could do that, but it hasn't done that yet, right? Mm -hmm. And the economy just isn't isn't strong enough. I mean, the the low inflation rate is an indication of just kind of excess capacity. Um, uh, if you will. So um, again, a, a good question. And theoretically, absolutely, it's a problem. Uh, but it's, it's just not working that way, or it's going to be a very long, um, uh, long payout, you know, it's, it's going to take a long time for that to, to happen, because there's enough ex, you know, even before this, we theoretically had a huge problem. So a couple specific questions and I, I've, been, I've written down as we we're going through. I know that with the forbearance that they're not. Yeah, and I've got, I've only time. got about three or four minutes. So okay, we'll, okay, yeah. real quick. Okay. Um, with the forbearance, the credit issues, I know that it's not supposed to ding your credit. However, it's going to show as a missed payment, you said? Or well, no, it's, well, it's payment? counted by core logic as a, as a missed payment because it is a missed payment, right? right? Okay. So um, it's counted there, but in terms of your bank and your credit score, it's not supposed to be a negative. I mean, that's what it says in the, in the act. Right. Okay. And then the last one for you, for me, um, evictions. I know that, that once this unemployment, excessive unemployment runs out this month, you're going to have a lot of people affected next month who were able to stay current on their rent because of that assistance. And that's not going to be there next month. And um, unless they step in and do something really quickly, th that's going to be a problem, isn't it? I think it's going to be an absolute huge problem. And that's, if you're going to ask me what keeps me up at night, that's it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the first wave in turn, because, 
you know, the job losses have really hit the working class the hardest. And this is majority, uh, majority renters with, with no social safety net and no personal, um, personal savings. So I think this is something it's very, very clear. We will not be surprised when this is a big issue. And we see a lot of trends happening next month. The numbers going the wrong direction next month, even more so than they were this month. Yeah. 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 Okay. I know you've got to run. Um, I'm, I'm gonna... sorry. I don't have more time. I really appreciate no, the questions. It was great. We loved having you. We really appreciate it. I'm going to keep on for a minute and tell them about some things coming up, but we're going to let you go. Okay. So you've got to run. Bye everybody. Thank you Thank so much. You. Bye. Okay, guys, just a, a couple things to put in your calendar. Um, there's some great things coming up. I hope you enjoy this one today. Remember, this is number, I think, 11, and we have the first 10 recorded at our nsdcrtv.com. A couple things coming up you want to put in your calendar. Next Tuesday at 10 o'clock, there's a presentation for using Glide to fill out your PV forms. And I was just on a call earlier and learned about it. While I was on that call, I actually used Glide to set up a couple of showings tomorrow. It's so much easier to do it through Glide. It's great. So make sure you put that in your calendar uh, next Tuesday at 10 o'clock. On Tuesday, August 4th, uh, COVID evictions. That's <laughs> timely, right? As the pandemic and assistance runs out, what you can and can't do and how that whole eviction process works. That's not just for property managers. We all have transactions where you have, what, what if a seller just decides not to move? I mean, we've got a transaction where it's a divorce and the wife's in the property with some kids, has no place to go and she's just not moving out and you can't evict her and there's a problem. And so make sure you tune in for that to learn about that. Again, that's Tuesday, August 4th. And then our next chit chat is August 6th. It's a Thursday. It's unusual, but that's the only time we could get. So it's a Thursday, August 6th. We're going to have the new DRE commissioner on to answer all the questions that you have about DRE licensing issues and enforcement of these rules and regulations and laws right now and, and what role they're going to play in that. So make sure you put that in your calendar for uh, Thursday, August 6th. That's a lot. So uh, again, this was a, a different type of presentation. It was a lot of macro, a lot of, of big picture things. We've also done a lot of the micro things, a lot of new forms and a clear cooperation and compliance and that. Um, but we wanted to make sure that you had a, a a broad range of information and that we keep you informed as much as possible. So uh, with that, we'll sign off and, but is that a Zoom meeting on Glide? Yes, it is. Um, check the CR website and it's called Glide for PV and you'll be able to, uh, to find that and make sure you attend that one. So with that, you guys uh, take care, stay safe, stay healthy, and we will see you as a group again on August 6th. Thank you.